Welcome to Shades of Black, Inside the Black Vote. I'm Christopher Norris, WHRY's community contributors and engagement editor. The success of Joe Biden in the 2020 presidential election is largely owed to black voters. And in his acceptance speech, Mr. Biden promised to repay the debt, saying, quote, you've always had my back and I'm going to have yours. So what should black voters expect from the Biden administration and what really motivated them to show up to the polls? In this episode, we'll explore those questions with a diverse panel of black voters. Joining us are Kenny Cooper, WHRY suburban reporter, James Williams, publisher of the Uptown Standard newspaper, Jasmine Sessions, founder of She Can Win, and Emma Tramble, founder of My Family Votes. Let's start with expectations. Black voters in 2020 showed up and showed out, and the result was Joe Biden winning the presidency. What should black voters expect and demand from this administration? Jasmine, let's start with you. Thank you, Chris, and I'm so happy to be here. I think that black voters should demand the full Monty. Um, we did deliver that presidency, and especially, I'm not sure where everyone's from, but I sit in Philadelphia. Shout out to uh, Philadelphia and the urban areas that truly delivered that election. And we should be expecting um, equitable practices, equitable legislation, focus groups. I most certainly uh, want to see President Biden in the Delaware Valley asking black and brown people, what are your needs and what are what are your concerns and how can we address them? And so far, so good. I will say his administration and his transition team have been beyond communicative mm -hmm. with black and brown communities and really taking in what we want and what we want to hear and what are our concerns and causes, especially in the Delaware Valley, because he is very partial to the Delaware Valley being from Delaware. Thank you for that. Jasmine, just a quick follow-up. Was there any part of you leading up to the election where you thought that maybe black voters like 2016 was going to sit this out? No. I was on the ground all across PA, and there I did not. Normally during the election, you encounter, I'm not voting because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Didn't hear it once. And I touched over 3,000 voters. Mm. Um, definitely didn't hear it once. People were fired up, ready to go, standing in line. And organizations on the ground, really grassroots organizations, were doing the work, making sure that we were turning out the vote. So, no, black and brown voters were fired up, ready to go. And look what happens when we all come together to vote. Absolutely. James, there was a lot at stake in this election, and black voters turned it out. What should they be expecting from this administration? Well, I think the, one of the things we need to see is um, some true police reform nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things we've seen in Philadelphia over, over the last couple of months, I, I guess over the last seven, eight, nine months, um, as we've seen some real legislation passed at the state level and at the local level, at the city level, uh, for police reform with the police reform working group. Um, but we need to see that taken on a national level. Uh, we need to see the uh, consent decrees come back mm. um, and, 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 and different other things that we need to see it actually um, tackled as far as um, police reform. I think that's one of the biggest factors for a lot of people, especially African-American males, is police reform. Um, another thing we need to see is the closing the gap of wealth. Um, and, and we need to actually see the improvement of our infrastructure and, 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 and bring it back more jobs. I mean, one of the things that Trump did and he, he held real high was that he delivered in the manufacturing sector. And, and we don't want to see that drop. We want to continue to see that um, progress in, in the climb. So I, I think it's a lot at stake right here. Yeah, I appreciate that, James, and what you said about policing. You know, a lot of people don't know the Obama administration had worked with a lot of police departments for the consent decrees, Philadelphia and Baltimore alike. Trump came in and his uh, attorney general said there was no need for that. Uh, it makes me think, though, James, that, you know, uh, police reform was certainly a motivation for me. Um, but I found that the conversation around policing during this election had divided black voters, particularly in the context of defund the police. Some black voters were like going hard. We want the, the you know, police to fund it. Some, some black voters were like, no, I want more police. And, uh, and, and then President-elect Biden at the time said, I'm not defunding the police. Do you think that we can reconcile with that, James, in terms of an expectation? Yes. Um, I, mean, I think, one, um, people um, did not truly understand what people said, meant when they said defund the police. And mm -hmm. I think and, and I only can speak from my opinion, but I think a lot of people thought as of how it's happened in Camden and, and other cities like that where you, you take away the police budget, right, and then you actually reinstate the police budget, basically taking away the budget, therefore you have to actually reapply your whole police department, right? So you can renegotiate your contracts with your police unions and, and vice versa. So I just don't think that was communicated properly. 
um, of, of how to go about that. But at the end of the day, I mean, true police reform is only going to come when you renegotiate police contracts, mm -hmm. right? You, you actually have to take the sting out of the FOP and, and, and nationally and, and, you know, what the FOP hangs over politicians' heads and the amount that they donate. I mean, one step we can take in police reform is to actually stop allowing the FOPs to donate to political campaigns, right? That takes a big sting out of it. You know, I, I ran the Beth Grossman campaign in Philadelphia um, in 2017, and one of our biggest backers was the FOP. I mean, it was the hardest thing for me to sit down and negotiate with them. Um, you know, and, and I always got a sense of nervousness when I went to the FOP. So later in the campaign, I would send other surrogates to, um, to handle that. But I understood the power that they wielded and how much they donated, right? And a lot of politicians on both sides of the aisle takes money from the FOP. First step in police reform is we actually have to take that, that option away. Um, public unions such as the FOP that has such a, a big grasp yeah. over what's going on in urban communities should not be allowed to donate and influence politicians. Thank you for that, James. Before I go to you, Kenny, Jasmine, I saw that your body language was suggesting that maybe police reform and tackling the unions, or I should say tackling the unions is the first step to police reform, is not something you agree with. I give you, want to give you a chance to respond. It's not that. I do think that the defund the police was a very hot topic in our black community. Um, some people wanted to wipe it out. Some people are thinking that defund does equal reform. Um, I think we cannot necessarily take away the ability, though, to do for the police to donate to a campaign, because if you do it for one union, now you have to do it for all. And what does that look like for the building trades, mm -hmm. for the hospitals, for ASME? That is what makes our political system runs. James, where we should go is let's look at them companies that are donating to the FOP, because there's quite a few. And let's hold them more accountable and say, what are your practices and values? Because it's not reflecting in your donations. So I don't think that we can necessarily take away their ability to donate to political campaigns because we'd have to do it across the board. And that's just not the way the political cycle works. As you know, James, because you did run campaigns, me, I'm a fundraiser by trade. I'd be out of business, to be honest, if you didn't <laughs> stop donating. However, we can hold those corporations responsible. Why are you donating to the police when black and brown bodies are being brutally murdered mm. daily by the police? We will no longer use your health insurance. We will no longer use your cable service. And we will no longer go to your grocery stores as long as you are donating to these causes. I feel like that's truly the way that we hold them accountable. I appreciate that, Jasmine. And I, just to follow up as well, um, do you agree that the first step to police reform is tackling the police contracts, as James implied or asserted? <laughs> I do. Here in Philly, we are making steps. Um, shout out to Councilwoman Catherine uh, Gilmore Richardson to try to reform that part. I do think the police contracts are a huge issue and it can be step one or step 1.5 to reform. I appreciate that. Kenny Cooper, I want to bring you into the conversation. What should black voters expect or demand from the Biden administration? I think they should kind of um, demand accountability. Uh, partially what we've seen uh, over the past couple election cycles is uh, we get these uh, politicians elected, and by way I mean black voters, and oftentimes the door kind of shuts in the face. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think that's what they need to demand. They need to demand that you're going to be accountable, you're going to listen, you're going to be responsive to the moment. And that's ultimately what this is about. It's about legislating for the moment and not things that you're trying to think about and play mental mind games and play these political games where I'm trying to appease both sides, the imaginary both sides. You have to be responsive to the moment. In the moment that we're living in, uh, I guess we're seeing like a nationwide awakening to a lot of the things that communities of color, particularly black communities, have been kind of raising as issues for quite some time, not just quite some time, but uh, when my grandparents were mm -hmm. my age and they were voting or when their grandparents were their age, uh, these are issues that we've kind of seen come up time and time again. And until um, politicians are accountable to themselves and hold themselves accountable to, okay, I'm going to actually listen to my uh, my constituents as opposed to me legislating on for them or on their behalf, it's you, know, you have to listen to them and be responsive to what they actually want. And I think that's what uh, black voters should demand of the Biden administration is that you be accountable for us uh, kind of for, for, for black voters kind of showing up in full force mm. and uh, powering your election. 
Qu quick follow-up, Kenny and, and James, I'd like you to weigh on this as well, and then we'll go to Emma. I, I hear a lot of people talk about holding politicians accountable, but outside of recalling an election, I mean, you, you can't recall an election, how does accountability materialize, or how should effective accountability materialize outside of recalling a candidate? Well, think, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, right, Kenny, I'm sorry. Okay, and I think that's a good question. And I think that ultimately, it may be really hard to hold federal and national candidates uh, accountable. It may, it may be a little bit more difficult, but you can definitely hold local leaders accountable. You can mm -hmm. definitely go to their office. You can definitely attend meetings. You can definitely call their phones. Uh, all those things that may be outside of the, uh, the daily activity of your average voter, you can definitely do. And I think once that happens in large numbers, you can definitely hold... Uh, people accountable. I was actually doing some reporting last night at a zoning board meeting, and there were uh, local leaders there that sh only showed up because their constituents had called and called and emailed and complained. And this is a zoning board meeting that lasted until 11 p.m., but they showed up and they stayed for the whole time because guess what? Their constituents actually put in... Uh, their constituents show them, we're going to hold you accountable. We, we elected you to this office. Now we want you to show up and be in opposition to this thing that we're all kind of uniting against. Uh, so I think those are the ways that you can hold candidates accountable. And now that may a little, be a little bit difficult to happen at like the national level with national candidates. We can definitely use some of those same practices. Uh, thank you for that. That's a very um, informative answer. James, did you want to weigh in? And then we'll go to Emma. I, I mean, I completely agree with Kenny. Um, when, when I worked in city council as a staffer, um, and I attended many zoning meetings, um, but the councilman, um, David O at the time, he, he really felt it was important to that because he had an open dialogue with his, his constituents. You know, um, we, we received a lot of complaints and, and we act, reacted on the complaints. You know, when the voters speak and when they bring it straight to the elected official's office, right? That's when you get change, right? When you actually bring it to their office. You know, you, you can do what you want to do on social media and you can do what you want to do in the streets and, and that's great. But nothing actually moved us more, you know, when it came to the soda tax, for example, than when constituents actually came to our office, mm -hmm. disrupted, our, disrupted our day, and actually gave their position. That really made us change our position. And, and I used to tell a lot of people, you can march in the streets all day, but if, you, if you're not bringing that into City Hall, if you're not bringing that to the state capitol and going to your legislators and going to their district offices by numbers, right, people by numbers, and communicating that, well, then, you know, the chances of you actually getting that message across is, is not as great as you actually engaging with these elected officials directly. I appreciate that. Emma Tramble, welcome to the conversation. Uh, I'd want to give you a chance to respond to everything that you've heard, but then also answer the question, what should black voters be expecting and demanding from the Biden administration? I had to take a lot of mental notes because there's a lot of issues. <laughs> One of the things that... I get to talk to voters all over the country, particularly uh, because I do issues advocacy and voter engagement work. And so I worked in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Georgia. Those were my primary states. And then work with organizers in Arizona. Um, that was one of the more, uh, one of the other battleground states. Um, I, I want to I wanna kind of uh, follow up on what Jasmine said about voters and whether they had any hesitancy about voting. That was a huge issue up until right before, like around end of September, October, there was a shift. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of rhetoric coming from Washington about what would happen to protesters if um, the current administration at the time won and people protested. And there was a line that then President Trump said, we will put them down. And that started resonating with a lot of um, particularly black men, younger black men. Um, and when the police in, I believe it was Portland, they were starting to pick up people. Well, we don't even know which law enforcement agency that was. It was picking people up and just kind of carting them off and to these undisclosed areas and they didn't have badges. That kind of turned um, some people who were actually probably not going to vote. Mm. And it got their attention. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that more among younger people. There were a lot of older people who were not that excited about voting for Biden. They had many opportunities to vote for him in the past, and they, they chose not to. Um, there are bills um, 
you know, he had a long track record, and people talk very right on the surface level around Bill um, without really noting the depth. But one of the big issues I have with how Black voters are approached is we have to do post-election asks when other groups are doing mm -hmm. pre-election asks. Mm -hmm. You know, the Biden administration shouldn't be going around doing a listening tour after they won, mm -hmm. right? It should have been like, hey, Black people, we're going to address your issues, and this is how we're going to do it. And then he did start to do that as he got, I think some someone put a bug in his ear, like, people are really thinking about not voting for you. You better come up with a Black agenda. <laughs> You know, and so when he started to talk a little more, more about systemic racism, he was very clear. Um, I would hear from voters, and I troll on people's social media all the time. I'm connected to a lot of activists and a lot of people who are just passive voters. And they were starting to say, oh, okay. So he, he, he gets it to some extent, at least he's talking about it. I can go with this. Plus, um, we're trying to dodge, you know, what might happen to our civil rights. So... Mm -hmm. This is a safe bet right now, and that's that's kind of the way I looked at that. Now there are a lot of issues. One of the big ones, when I see a long queue for voting, that makes me nervous. Mm. That is that is a red flag for voter suppression. I've worked in Georgia since 2018. That place will break your heart if you work in voting rights. And one of the things that we have to do is put some teeth back into it, at least. Um, the Voting Rights Act, or mm. it has to be reformed altogether. Um, because we know in Harrisburg, as they say, the devil is busy, and they are working on ways to suppress our vote right now. That, you know. That's a, that's a great um, transition, uh, Emma, to my next question. Jasmine, I'd, li I'd like to start with you on that. A clear and present danger, as, as Emma implied, is uh, voter suppression. And should a new Voting Rights Act be among our expectations and demands from this administration? And if, and if so, what should be written in this document? Chris, that's a big question. <laughs> or Friday afternoon. Um, absolutely. Emma, Emma is absolutely right. Uh, voter suppression is something very real. It can be subtle or in your face. Sometimes you don't even know what it's called, right? Mm -hmm. Slowing down the USPS system that was voter suppression. Most people just think, oh, well, something's happening with the post office. No, what happened was we were voting by mail. And so then they tried to put a barrier in place so that we couldn't. Um, much like Emma, I trolled Philadelphia on election day, COVID safe though, but I did go out and I looked at the lines and I went to some poll watchers and I wanted to know why is this wait two hours? Why are you only having one voting machine working? Mm. But the average voter who is not informed like this panel, can't even identify it as voter suppression. So much like Emma said, we have to start with that education, not just six months before the election. It needs to be part of, and um, I say this because my daughter goes to a school where they are constantly teaching about voting. On her little book bag, right before the election, she had an I Voted sticker. I said, well, where'd you get it? She said, well, mom, there's an election coming up. I was so impressed that it is now part of that curriculum that voting isn't even a thought. I mean, she always went with me and her father, but it's not even a thought for that class. And that needs to be commonplace in every school where we are educating our, our children, our adults, especially our millennials and our Gen Zers about voting. And what is voter suppression? What does it mean that your vote will count? So yes, absolutely, that Voting Rights Act needs to be revamped and revised. And the first thing I would do is make voting rights and voting education mandated in schools. Mm. I gotta tell you, I, I, I've seen it in action with my six-year-old daughter who came home with a little certificate saying, I watched the inauguration virtually. I couldn't even believe it. And she was like, well, mom, I voted for them. So yeah, of course they won. And it's not even a thought because it is ingrained in her from first grade. That is something that every child needs to experience. So by the time they are voting age, it's not even a thought. That needs to be incorporated in curriculum very early on. Thank you for that. And there needs to be real serious crimes for voter suppression. 
Mm. There needs to be real serious consequences for this. Whether you can identify it or not, once we know what it is, there needs to be real serious consequences for that. Because your vote is your right. And we all need to be voting like our life depends on it. Because as we can see, from 2016 to 2020, our lives actually depended on it. Mm. See, it was a big question, Jasmine, and you knocked it right out the park. No, sorry. I get on my box. <laughs> no, please. This is this is so boxer welcome here. James, I wanted to bring you into that conversation too. Um, you know, what do you think about a new voting rights act? And should civic ed education in schools, as as Jasmine talked about, should that be a priority or a luxury? Well, uh, so let, let me start it this way, and I'm, I'm going to answer this in two parts. Um, um, when during the 2016 election, I took my goddaughter to work the polls with me. Um, she was a big Hillary Clinton fan, right? She was about maybe about four. I still have a picture of her sitting in front of a Hillary Clinton sign at a polling place in the 22nd Ward of Philadelphia, Grace Epiphany Baptist Church, right? Because to me, I grew up, my first election, I ever worked with my dad. My dad was a UAW uh, union rep. He was the shop store for the UAW. My first election I worked, I was eight years old, mm. right? So that's something that just been brought up in me. You know, like that was just something that's brought up in me. So I'm also a high school track coach, right? And all of my kids, what we do is we discuss politics. We mm -hmm. discuss elections, right? Because the school's not doing that where we're at, right? So it's my job to bring that education to them, you know? And, and maybe we need more programs, right? So we have our nonviolence programs in the communities. Let's start actually working on, because we're not getting that in the Philadelphia school district in mm -hmm. some cases. Mm -hmm. Let's start working on voter programs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and programs to help develop more young people to understand the process of voting and why they vote and the importance of voting. Now, I can tell you this as being a former Republican operative, right? The goal of the GOP is to suppress. Mm. That's what we did, right? Now, you can do that by slowing down the mail or you can do that by IP targeting. You can do that by social media, right? There's so many ways that are suppression tools um, that we utilized in the GOP. You know, I was fortunate enough to have that training, right, from them that they said, hey, here's a guy who's raised as a Democrat and he's over here with us. So let's educate him because he can really break into voter rich districts. I live in the 50th Ward, right? He can be really an asset in the 50th Ward for us. Over time, I realized that... <laughs> I, I, I can't sell what y'all want me to sell, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I can't sell what you want me to sell. So I became a rhino very quick. Mm. Um, but the, the importance of that is, and I, and I say this, right, is that- And for our audience, oh, James, rhino, Republican in name only. Republican in name only, mm -hmm. which I'm a centrist. I was never really a Republican. I was never a Democrat. I was never an ideologue, right? Mm -hmm. Like my whole thing was always down the middle. You know, my voting history shows I voted for Green Party candidates. When I was a Republican ward leader, I, most of the time I voted for Democrat elected officials. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it didn't matter to me. My goal was to be an operative, right? You know, and I've worked for Democrats while I was out also a Republican ward leader behind the scenes. Now that I'm no longer in the party and in the structure, I can say that I did that, right? Um, but I will, I will tell you this. A big part of what we did was to suppress. Blexit, for example is nothing but a suppression apparatus. Don't think it's anything besides what it really is. It's a voter suppression apparatus. The goal of that is, is to get as many black Republicans out on the ground to red pill as many black voters as possible. That is the agenda of Blexit. They, they might disguise it in community relations. They might disguise it in what we're giving back to the community. They might disguise it as a book bag giveaway or, or a barbecue or taking kids to games or whatever, because they do a lot of stuff on the ground. But at the end of the day, it's nothing but a recruitment tool and a suppression tool. Let me, let me, let me, let me so stop you. I, let me, I'd let like me to jump in here. Please, please, Emma. Okay. So there's one thing about when you're looking at, uh, you know, what happens externally to the government around voters. But when your own state legislature is working against you, mm -hmm. and this is what we really have to look at, right? As we got closer to the election, the state legislature was basically trying to move in and strip away things like, uh, you know, like, oh, okay, uh, Governor Wolf, we're negotiating. So if you want to start counting ballots before election day, then, hey, let's make these changes to the law. And like they wanted to make law changes to the laws as people were actively voting. Mm. That's one of the things that the Voting Rights Act 
it was basically, it was really focused on several states. Um, and it basically said, is the closer you get to elections, it's frozen. It's it. That's it. You can't make changes. And when that guy rolled back, it's like, can you call it the part of the Section 5 or whatever, got rolled back, what we saw was not only in the southern states where they were had them on lockdown, we started to see the same poison pill. That, for me, it was like a poison gas started to, like, go over the nation. Same tactic. Like, I'm a strategist, and I work on the Democrat side. We can read you, but we're trying to convince our voters that, you know, we actually know what we're doing. And that's the one thing. We need more strategists who look like the people you're trying to talk to. Mm. So, you know, black voters are very savvy. But the thing is, they have to know, okay, this is a trusted source. I have to take my phone off the hook before the election because enough people in the public were, like, sharing my number, and I do run a voter education program. But I have work to do. It's because we don't have trusted sources where we can go, you know what, don't listen to, you can still mail your ballot in September 30th, right? It's okay. Just don't mail it 15 days before the election. That's ridiculous. Emma, so I want to... Go ahead. Yeah, I want to bring, before we run out of time, I want to bring Kenny into this conversation, too. And let me just also mention that Jasmine is giving me life with all her movements, but she's agreeing with everybody. <laughs> but but the Kenny, person too. <laughs> Kenny, I want to give you a chance to respond to everything that you've heard um, from, from Jasmine, Emma, and, um, and, and James. And, and also, I'd like to hear from you. What do you think the consequences should be for voter suppression? Well, to answer the kind of like the first part of that question in terms of uh, what needs to be done to kind of kind of fix voter suppression, I mean, I think the answer was already said mentioned by Emma, which was uh, kind of restructuring mm -hmm. uh, and kind of rebuilding up that that Civil Rights uh, Act, Vo Voters Rights Act, and I think um, um, what needs to happen is that they need to kind of push through the uh, John Lewis uh, kind of named uh, act. Uh, back to the Senate. I mean, they passed the bill, I believe, in 2019. The House did. Of course, it died in the Senate. But now with control, I mean, they, they have the ability to kind of reimagine uh, kind of civil rights and, and, and voting rights act um, back into American life. I mean, some of the things that were in the bill were like same day voter registration, online voter registration. Uh, there was even some support, I believe, for, for D.C. statehood. There was there were, there were a lot of things mentioned talking about voter purge, uh, voter registration purges and whatnot. So I think all those things kind of need to happen at the same time. And, and, and once that happens, I think that you can kind of get actual oversight to the voting process. Uh, like Emma was also talking about, where it's, it's sometimes it's individual states and they kind of put in these, these poison pills, as she was saying, uh, that kind of disrupt voting and like going back to what Jasmine uh, was saying that a lot of the stuff that happens to the to some voters that aren't keyed in it doesn't look like voter suppression it may just look like paperwork it may just look like oh it's just a long day it may just look like oh I came to the polls at the wrong time when in all actuality those are forms of voter suppression Kenny Cooper James Williams Emma Tramble and Jasmine Sessions thank you so much for participating in this conversation it's a talk too big for one night so stay tuned for part two Thank you for watching Shades of Black, Inside the Black Vote. Part two of this conversation will air next week, same time, same channel. If you have thoughts and commentary about the topics we talked about today, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at talkback at whyy.org. Until next time, for WHYY, I'm Christopher Norris. Goodbye. This program is a part of your democracy, an initiative funded by the Sutherland Family Foundation.